Inesh Tech and Ingenieria Radio present Inesh Tech Science Bit, a monthly signature dedicated to decode science and technology trends. Inesh Tech Science Bits, decoding science bit, bit by, by bit. Hello, welcome to Inesh Tech Science Bits, a podcast in partnership between Inesh Tech and Ingenieria Radio. Today, we invite you to break with the laws of classical physics. We will challenge human intuition and dive into the behavior of waves and particles in the weird macroscopic world, where a particle can be in many places at once and a famous cat can be both alive and dead. If this sounds crazy to you, keep calm. We are well accompanied on this trip. Ariel Guerreiro and Nuno Silva are researchers from CAP, the Center for Applied Photonics, and they are today at Inesc Tech Science Pits to tell us about quantum engineering and its foundations. Be welcome. How are you? Great, Patricia. Well, first, let me thank you for the invitation to be here. Yeah, welcome. And, yeah, second, besides working in shorts, I think there are no good things about the, the situation we are living. But we are trying to make the, the most of this time. So having what can be called fruitful days of theoretical research in our homes. And today we'll try to have some fun chatting with you and with, uh, with the people at home uh, a bit about one of the most exciting topics in physics these days. And <laughs> let's hope it, it will be fun. I'm full of expectations for the next few minutes, actually. But first, I have to be honest with you. I was not sure on how to start this conversation. So then I, I had the brilliant idea that there is nothing better than starting with a fundamental question. That is, what is quantum engineering, Ariel? Can you explain to us? Hello, Patricia. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, basically, uh, quantum engineering uh, is something fairly recent uh, in the field of engineering. It's basically a multidisciplinary approach uh, to quantum physics, which focuses on trying to uh, use quantum phenomena to uh, develop novel technology, which we usually refer as uh, quantum technology. Basically, uh, to understand this, this idea, you can establish a parallel uh, with the history of electricity. If you, if you go back uh, a few centuries uh, to the early 18th century, um, we had physicists like Volta, Ampere, Ohm and Maxwell who basically established the foundations of electricity. Uh, later, in the 19th century, uh, other scientists like Bell, Tesla, Edison, they, they basically took the science and converted it, it into electrical engineering. Um, and brought uh, the, the laws of electricity to the real world as a form of technology. So, uh, as of today, as, of res as a result, today most of the electronic technology uh, used by humans is basically f uh, supported by the fundamental principles established by uh, these early researchers. Now, what we want to do with quantum engineering is basically the same. We want to take the principles, the laws of quantum physics, which have been developed in the past century uh, by physicists like Planck, Einstein, Bohr, Schrödinger, all common names for, for most of us. And uh, we want to, um, to bring the, the, the new science that they developed into uh, real world applications. So um, in some way, uh, they, th these early physicists, they, they began what could be called the first quantum revolution. And what we want to do now is to bring that revolution into technology and uh, develop uh, or spark uh, a second quantum revolution. Uh, now, quantum engineering is still um, in its early stages. Um, we still have a lot of scientific knowledge which has to be converted into practical applications. Um, but this is a, a wonderful challenge that we, we want to, to take over, to take and um, to bring uh, uh, new applications into supermarket, well, supermarket, off the shelf uh, applications that people can use. Thank you. And after hearing your explanation, the role of quantum engineering almost seems clear to us. But the truth, Nuno, is that the laws of the macroscopic world are quite different from the macro one, and one might say even 
weird. They were actually questioned by some of its founders, mentioned by Ariel, like Schrodinger and Einstein. So, I ask you, does God play dice, Nuno? <laughs> well, that's the old Einstein question. And it is funny that although we now call Einstein a founder due to his work on a photoelectric effect, he opposed to some of the quantum physics constructions and interpretation during most of his life. So regarding the actual question, I would say that the answer is, as everything in quantum realm, something between true and false. Maybe it plays dice, but it... it it should be quantum dice at least. So quantum physics is a domain of what we physicists call modern physics. The motivation behind this, um, this domain and this theory results to the realization that at the microscopic scale, I mean, typically the scale of the atom, the laws of physics seems different. Uh, they challenge our intuition developed from direct observations and measurements of the microscopic world. So. We can start with a simple concept. In the, microscope, in the macroscopic world, we have two types of physical objects. We have waves and we have particles. Waves, like sound and radio waves, can be understood as energy that propagate in time over vast regions of space. Multiple waves can coexist in the same region of space and sometimes, but not always, they can interfere with each other. On the other hand, particles behave as localized rigid bodies with well-defined properties like mass, energy, and position. But when we go to the microscopic scale, this distinction was purpose. You have particles that seem to behave like waves and waves that seem to behave like particles. Well, indeed, any entity at these scales exists as both particle and wave at the same time, a principle that in quantum physics we call particle wave duality. So how can, how can we bring this principle into new technology? Well, for example, behaving as a wave, electrons can tunnel through a potential barrier and enable finer spatial resolution in electron microscopy. Well, another paradigm shift concerns the state of the system. In the microscopic world, we can think of objects having well-defined properties. If a particle is here, it cannot be there, if a cat is alive, it cannot be dead. But when we go again to the quantum world, a particle, and we are talking about atoms or electrons, is actually delocalized. And even a cat, at least a quantum cat, a Schrodinger cat, can be both dead and alive. To this we call the superposition principle. These days, the superposition principle is the basis of qubits, the bits used in quantum computers to store and manipulate information. But on the earlier days of quantum mechanics, this state quantization picture was fundamental to explain spectroscopy of atomic matter and to develop the foundations of the laser. I mean, we can go on for hours and days talking about other quantum peculiarities, principles like entanglement and its importance in quantum cryptography and quantum communication and quantum teleportation. But you, get already the, you already get the general idea. There are new laws out there that introduce a whole new world of possibilities and that can be integrated into new technologies. And that is what we are trying to do. Great. But if the macroscopic behavior of energy and matter differs so much from the microscopic quantum counterpart, how can we harmonize these two empiric versions of the physical world? Ariel, do you have an answer? Well, uh, you have to understand the following. Uh, this exotic behavior of quantum particles and uh, atoms, this usually occurs at a very, very small scale. Uh, and Usually, when we want to observe this, this, this behavior, we need to isolate these particles to have one single atom or just a few. And therefore, uh, at, this, at this level of simplicity and at this very small scale, um, the, uh, the particles can directly exhibit their quantum behavior, their quantum nature. But when we go to the macroscopic world, uh, we see uh, objects with many, many atoms, with many, many particles. So the, uh, the interplay between these atoms uh, uh, 
somehow um, uh, obscures their quantum behavior. So they, at the microscopic level, they seem to behave in a different way as they their uh, microscopic constituents. So there's there's a, there's a difference there, and this is this is um, actually one of the challenges um, behind uh, behind uh, quantum technologies or quantum science is that if you want to use these quantum properties, you need to access, in some extent, this microscopic world to look at individual atoms, to look at individual at systems which often range in the scale of the, uh, of the um, nanometers. So just a few atoms. And this is particularly challenging. And you mean light, you referred to the light. So um, it's with light that the Center for Applied Photonic Works. How CAP is exploring the potential of the quantum properties of light and matter to develop new technologies? Well, so to explain that, let me go back to your previous question, why is it, why is so different my, the behavior at the microscopic and at the macroscopic world? And to the idea that if you want to have access to quantum properties, you need to go into the, 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 the microscopic world. You need to, uh, to be able to control, affect and measure um, either individual or very few atoms. Now, uh, to do that, you need a tool, something which allows you, you, as a scientist, as someone who lives in the macroscopic world, to have access to the microscopic world. So you need a bridge. This is where light comes into place, because uh, light has these wonderful properties. It, it is not only a quantum object, which has intrinsic quantum properties that we can easily manipulate and control um, in, a, uh, in a lab, um, have a laser, a few lenses, and we can actually produce some experiments, which usually, which can, um, somehow affect and control the quantum properties of light. But more importantly, it is something which allows us, by shining light on atoms, on it, to control microscopic systems. So it's something which uh, somehow bridges um, the, the microscopic and the, uh, the microscopic world. Um, and this is, where, this is why we at CAP were so interested in, our, in light and how it can be applied to uh, quantum technologies. So we, we, know, we know that nowadays um, there is this very big interest in, in quantum technologies to use these quantum properties to do things better and more efficiently. And in fact, there's, there is uh, uh, inf uh, people who predict that there's going to be a big market for, um, for um, quantum technologies, and in particular, sensing. Because sensing takes advantage of a, a, a very special quantum property, the extraordinary sensibility or sensitivity of quantum states, the states of very small systems of atoms, to the environment, to what happens around these atoms. So this is actually very interesting because this is usually considered a, 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 a difficulty when you're building quantum computers because in quantum computers you want to keep your, your quantum state isolated from the environment so that it, it can only be changed by the quantum operations that you want to make on this, on, on this uh, state, on the state of this very small, very, um, very special system. Uh, but when you go to sensing, uh, it's precisely the opposite. In this case, uh, the sensitivity, the fact that the environment, what goes around the system, can actually change considerably the state of that system is actually an enabler, because that change is what we're going to use to detect properties in the environment. And so there is, there is, um, there is a lot of uh, interest in uh, developing quantum sensing technologies, okay? and, uh, because they'll be exceptionally sensitive and people predict that uh, there will be a market in the range of hundreds of millions of euros, which is expected to grow uh, around 10% per year until 2024. So there's a lot of investment worldwide into these sort of technologies. And this, this, these, uh, the applications of this range from atomic clocks, uh, magnetic sensors, uh, plasmonic quantum sensors, gravity sensors, and uh, many, many, many others which have um, applications from military and defense, uh, automotive industry, healthcare, agriculture, and many, many others. So now, this is the context. 
in, in CAP, we have been developing uh, sensors for a long, long time, optical sensors. Okay? They don't actually, uh, traditionally, they don't, they don't explore quantum properties, but the step that we need to take from our previous technologies in optical sensing to quantum sensing using light is relatively small. So um, there was this big effort to, 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 uh, to adapt this, this sensing technology to, um, to explore the quantum structure at, uh, at the macroscopic scale. And from this, we proposed, uh, well, we, we are uh, uh, conducting a project called Green Nano Sensing, which is dedicated to the development of uh, optical functional metamaterials for sensing. Uh, now, you may ask, what are uh, functional metamaterials? Basically, they are, they are uh, artificial materials that have exotic properties and they cannot, these properties cannot be found in natural substances. So these materials have to be produced usually by having a very complex uh, nanostructure, in our case incorporating metallic nanowires and dielectric components. And uh, if you build them correctly and you control the, the quantum properties of light at a microscopic scale, or sorry, the quantum properties of matter at a microscopic scale, and use light to explore those properties, uh, you are able to have materials which have high sensitivity. For example, uh, in our case, we are looking at hydrogen detection and the measurement of electromagnetic fields, which can be produced um, um, in a way uh, that is exceptionally sensitive. Um, for example, one of the materials we have developed is a material which becomes um, opaque, so it's, it's a material which changes from transparent to opaque, when you have uh, uh, small concentrations of hydrogen. And this is very important for um, um, security and uh, safety applications. In another line of research, we are trying to develop uh, optical sensors that incorporate uh, metallic nanostructures. Um, this, this, um, this, this type of this new approach or this line of research tries to access directly the quantum properties of plasmons at these nanoscales, at the scales of very, of very close to the size of the atom. And we, what we found out is that by changing the structure of this metal, of the, the metallic components of the metallic nanostructures that we include in these sensors we can, be, can build something which behaves as if it was uh, an artificial atom, basically. Uh, and because it depends on the geometry, on the size and the shape of these constituents, we can actually customize the properties of these atoms. So we can build artificial atoms which have um, the properties that we want. And the applications uh, of this type of uh, plasmonic atoms to sensors are tremendous. And no, no, you told us about uh, not about sensors, but about simulations. And I have two questions for you: why and how quantum simulations? Yeah, in in Cap, we we developed some work in quantum sensing, as Ariel told us. Uh, but there is also another another domain of interest to our team that is quantum simulations. So so far, we have talked about how quantum laws are different from the microscopic world. In the, in the microscopic world, things, things seem to behave differently. But that's okay. We know the math behind it. We know the quantum mechanics. And we can work with that towards new, new technology. For example, there are multiple ways to explore these quantum, these quantum laws to design new electronic or optical materials based on these unnatural uh, properties at the microscopic level. But the problem is that when you try to simulate these materials, you require to simulate a prohibitive number of interdependent equations, which is practically impossible to do, even with the best supercomputers we have available these days. So in the 60s, Feynman, Feynman, Richard Feynman came up with a crazy idea to work around this problem. Basically, he argued that if you are able to design a physical system that follows exactly the same physical laws as the one you are trying to simulate, call it an analog system, then this system acts exactly as a computer, an analog quantum computer. This is like a first generation quantum computer, which was rebranded uh, with a new name and is now called quantum simulator. 
The trick here is that while the system to be simulated is inaccessible, the quantum simulator exists at a microscopic scale and can be controlled easily in the lab. So the challenge, of course, is now to seek for versatile systems that we can set up in our lab, turn some knobs and simulate a desired quantum system. And again, light is instrumental here. In the last couple of years, we have been exploring an emerging field that is called quantum fluids of light. In essence, the idea behind it is that when you have light propagating inside the nonlinear optical media, it follows exactly the same physical model as a quantum fluid. So, if you look at the dynamics of a simple laser beam propagating inside the nonlinear optical crystal, or even a liquid crystal cell, it can act as a quantum simulator, mimicking the behavior of a quantum fluid. The consequences of this are remarkable. For example, suddenly with these systems, you can go to the lab and perform at room temperature simulations of phenomena that are either art, costly, or even inaccessible to study. We are talking about phenomena like superfluidity and even the elusive supersolidity, that is a state of matter that is theoretically accepted to exist but cannot be found in nature nor realized in the lab. So in this field, we have a collaboration that started recently uh, with a project that was granted by FCT with the Institute of Physics of Belgrade. So in this project, we are, uh, we are uh, exploring resonant regimes of light matter interaction to finally tune the optical properties of a cloud of gas. So the interest on this project is that if we are successful, that would give us a great control over the optical properties of a medium. We can tune the, the lightscape, we can create light landscapes of optical properties of the medium. And this means that our lab setups would play an, as an extremely versatile quantum simulation platform, and that would allow us to go well beyond what is done in the field so far. So you both talked about very ambitious projects with light. But may I challenge you? <laughs> Is the ability of thinking at the speed of light coming soon, Nuno? Well, maybe. <laughs> uh, there is this, the, this recent advances on artificial intelligence. And what they taught us is that nonlinear processes play a relevant role in distributed cognitive computing frameworks, what we call artificial neural networks. Also, while most of the work has focused on computer simulation and is performed in silico, some researchers have also been trying to bring these concepts to the hardware level, arguing that there is an energy efficiency in these so-called neuromorphic ships when compared against the von Neumann computers. Of course, neuromorphic ships are not restricted to electronic uh, wafers, or electronic ships, you, and the advances that uh, you, you found in the photonic circuit domain make us dream about light speed computing devices. But the question is that photonics world misses the high nonlinear dynamics that are required to implement this kind of solutions, because photons uh, are, are difficult to, to interact with each other. So. One thing about the quantum simulators we talked before is that in those, light features highly nonlinear dynamics even at extremely low powers. We are talking about uh, at the, the photon level. You have two photons that can interact in those kind of quantum simulators. Well, this led us to think that maybe we can use these quantum simulators as physical systems to support implementations of artificial neural networks. This is one of the exciting things we have been exploring recently, and we are trying to establish in the cornerstones of this topic that we believe can translate into a powerful new technology in short to medium term. And finally, Ariel, what's next? Well, to tell the truth, we, ha we have a plan uh, at CAP that started a few years ago uh, to develop these quantum technologies. Um, and this has been a, a, a long process from um, developing the fundamentals and then um, training people and uh, trying to improve the existing technology and uh, trying to build um, 
collaborations worldwide and even uh, na national wide. So the, the the thing that you need to keep in mind is that there is this temptation um, to oversell quantum technologies and to make uh, strong claims uh, that, to tell you the truth, they are not realistic. Um, there, are, there have been several examples in other fields of research that promised uh, wonders and unfulfilled revolutions that attempted uh, to, well, this was basically in an effort to try to capture funding. Um, and this is, was um, mostly uh, directed at people who, who the, uh, the institutions, the uh, science foundations, which, um, which um, basically support uh, the funding for, for, for science. And when you look at them, they, you see that they didn't really um, deliver uh, immediate applications and uh, short-term economic turnover. Instead, uh, what we can learn from this experience is that uh, you must be able to uh, manage and program things from the short to the long term uh, and start beginning today to develop uh, fundamental tools and skills for the future. So uh, to identify uh, uh, market niches and uh, places or uh, fields where you can actually contribute and actually refraining from trying to cover all the topics in quantum, uh, in quantum technologies, for example. Uh, so we need actually a roadmap that is able to encompass technologies with different maturities. And you've seen uh, from what we've talked about, we have uh, applications in um, sensing, which uh, basically they, 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 they try to push forward what we already knew, the, the, the skills that we already have at CAP, into um, a new, uh, better applications of, uh, of uh, light now to explore quantum properties and to develop quantum technologies. It's basically something which um, started to produce uh, results in a much shorter term. Uh, we also seen uh, uh, from, from Nunos that um, we also have ideas to be uh, more uh, groundbreaking uh, and to be more disruptive by developing new ways of, of using light to actually produce the produce information processing and this comes this actually comes from a, a general idea that uh, we need to, um, to we need to um, understand that quantum technologies um, they they um, they they uh, they need to go back to fundamentals, to fundamental physics, and we use the knowledge is developed in uh, in this more fundamental approach to to do technologies, and that takes time. So we need to be patient and have a, a long work ahead to 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 do this. And having this in mind, actually, we just started another research line at CAP uh, in quantum technologies that uh, aims to develop experimental skills in quantum optics. So the idea is to manipulate uh, the actual quantum properties of light and look into applications of, of just a few phantom, uh, uh, photons to metrology. So it's some, some, to some extent um, to develop on uh, the use of light for measurements, for sensing. And this is a, still a very embryonic work, but we hope to um, to, to be the basis for future developments. So, so if, if, you, if I could make, uh, just a, to give you a general picture, the idea is that we are looking into uh, quantum information technologies, not only sensing, which means the capturing of, of information from the environment, to processing, which basically is what uh, quantum simulations and quantum computing actually does. And um, from this, continuously developing new insights from the fundamental approach into our applications. That sounds great. Ariela Nuno, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Perhaps, given the nature of your research, which is based on very low TRLs, almost level minus one, <laughs> you could be the first guests on these science suites. But here, nonlinearity also works, and I believe that today, more than ever, this conversation has had value to the listener's knowledge and way of thinking. 
What is invisible to the eye can be challenging and cause strangeness and fear to humans. But there is light. So good luck for the projects that CAP is developing. Thank you so much for using your vast experience in applied photonics without ever forgetting that tomorrow's technologies are based on the work in fundamental science that we do today. For all of you who are listening, thank you very much. We shall meet again soon for another insightful conversation about science and technology. Inestec and Ingenieria Radio present Inestec Science Pit, a monthly signature dedicated to decode science and technology trends. Inestec Science Bits, decoding science bit by bit.